I have to my immediate left, Mabula Soumaroro. Uh, just next to her is Françoise Vergès. Next to her is Christina Sharp. And finally, Denise Da Silva. So what we'll do is uh, have each of the four uh, people on stage next to me read or discuss something briefly that relates to these questions that we've been raising, posing, and, and trying to answer in various ways. After which point, I will pose a couple of other questions or thinking points of departure um, to encourage a conversation between the four of them or the five of us and then open the floor to all of you to ask questions and as I always say when I moderate things I always have like a lot more questions than I'm allowed time for so if you're slow to ask for the mic to ask a questions I'm going back in so just to say so can we perhaps maybe start with you Denise and move along this way or if you must. Is anyone chomping at the bit to, to say something? Mamboula, thank you. Thank you. Bonsoir. Voilà. Je recommence. Um, donc, ne vous inquiétez pas, je vais parler en anglais. Euh, mais j'ai décidé de commencer euh, en français parce que nous sommes à Paris et euh, je suis censée être à la maison. Donc, euh, euh, Paris mon, étant mon lieu de naissance, euh, je suis chez moi. Voilà. Euh, les remerciements sont importants euh, également, donc euh, je remercie vraiment, euh, très sincèrement, euh, Tina Kent et euh, Kaya Maglover et Françoise Vergès, donc le, le comité d'organisation. Euh, maybe I should switch to English now for all the. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just thank you, thanking people and I'm thanking the Paris Organizing Committee uh, that includes Tina Kent, uh, Kaya Maglover, dear, dear colleagues, and Françoise Vergès. A dear colleague and friend, um, I also want to thank Reed Hall and uh, Lauren Wolf, and I want to acknowledge the, my comrades in arms, um, the people who are tenured in the French Academia, which is a rare feat. So Yala Kisakudi is here, and uh, thank you for your work. Um, thank you, Claire, for your work. Uh, Claire Oberon Garcia, you're here in the States, but that matters um, as well. Uh, this is a very precious moment for me and for others um, because these conversations, complex, difficult, uh, sophisticated, are very rare in the French space, right? We're in Paris, France, which has been a space that has open door open doors for people from the African diaspora, particularly African Americans and blacks from the Caribbean, but the French space, and Paris in particular, has been not s such an open space for the indigenous uh, black populations, the black Europeans uh, that we need to talk about, even when we mention the refugees, the migrants. Uh, there are also black indigenous populations in this Europe that is not only white. So, um, and I also want to um, end this thank you section by um, thanking, um, you know, uh, Sedia Hartman that I have just met in, in flesh uh, <laughs> after working so much on Lose Your Mother. And so thank you for your work. And uh, everybody's been calling him AJ, but I'm not his friend, but Arthur Jaffa. <laughs> Um, your work is, is simply amazing and this combination, this tense combination of pain and beauty is, um, brings me to tears every time I watch your work. So thank you for your work wherever you are in the room. I don't know. Okay, with the red hat. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I just prepared um, a few comments and then we'll uh, continue with the conversation. So I was a bit taken aback by the first question. What would it look like to refuse anti-blackness? Indeed, I am certain that we, would, that we would all easily agree tonight that resistance is part and parcel of the histories, the narratives, and the cultures of the African diaspora. Even if we decide to shun the term resistance itself and replace it with terms such as self-defense or simply the assertion in a countering move of basic humanity, we are still dealing with the fact that anti-blackness has been rejected, countered, not complied with, and refused throughout the centuries and the world. But first, what is anti-blackness? 
Could we tentatively define it as the peculiar treatment of the populations constructed and construed as black in the modernity project of the West we inhabit to this day? My point is that blackness had to be made a category first for anti-blackness to, to come into being. Or perhaps the two categories I have mentioned, blackness and anti-blackness, came into being simultaneously. Either way, those who were and continue to be categorized as black throughout history and geography have accepted, refused, and negotiated this identity. There are multiple examples of, for each, I'm sorry, there are multiple examples for each act, accept, acceptance, refusal, and negotiation. To me, blackness and anti-blackness have operated hand in hand. Blackness was created for the sole purpose of exercising anti-blackness. Could it be then that refusing one would mean refusing the other? The answer to that question could be not if we truly engage this radical possibility we have been invited to reflect upon tonight. The radical possibility for living otherwise could then to be to refuse anti-blackness while clinging to blackness. That would be the feat. To disassociate the bodies and identities from the anti-black discourse, the oppression, the exclusion, and the various ever more intricate, constantly morphing, highly creative processes of marginalization. What would that mean? How can the bodies and identities shaped by history and politics be dissociated from the discourse and practices of systemic anti-blackness? Is it a matter of mere erasure? Could that even be feasible? I do not believe so. Rather, I think that only one of the two categories needs to disappear, anti-blackness, as it is the deadlier. To realize black futurity means to bring into concrete existence the coming days of blackness and black people. It means to overcome the death, the demises, the incarceration, all forms of dispossessions, the, the assaults, the inequalities, the injustices. To realize black futurity as radical possibility for living otherwise means to not merely survive, but fully live, to live fully in justice, equality, and equity. Therefore, in the search of radical possibility, we need to remember that anti-blackness has, throughout the ages, meant the partition of humanity. Anti-blackness has meant all sorts of hierarchies anchored in dehumanized human bodies. In opposition to that, I choose to understand blackness as the ultimate proof and assertion of humanity. In other words, if blackness has been constructed as the object of anti-blackness, blackness has been the constant affirmation of humanity. And in that regard, blackness has too much to teach the world. What if we began to consider blackness not solely in relation to anti-blackness? What if we began to consider radical blackness as anti-whiteness? Living otherwise would then not be restricted to achieving the goals established by whiteness. Living otherwise would not even mean to share the fundamentally unju unjust wages of whiteness in a more egalitarian fashion. Living otherwise would mean negating whiteness, refusing whiteness, and the worldview it necessarily entails, the flawed societies it necessarily produces. Whiteness needs blackness to exist. Radical blackness, on the contrary, does not and should not need whiteness to be. Black futurity, in my view, should rest on the radical reorganization of our worldview. In the particular case of France, a nation state that has great difficulty understanding the place it occupies in the history of the African diaspora, the situation is extremely interesting. Indeed, here, just like in other spaces of the Black Atlantic, racial categories are fully operational. However, the French racial categories only operate in silence and theoretical, even legal, colorblindness. Refusing anti-blackness here means breaking the silence and making visible what has been made invisible or what has been forgotten. Um, as uh, Tina Kempt reminded us, um, I mean, told us of a conversation she had recently with Françoise Vergès, um, 
talking about uh, how negritude has been forgotten, how uh, black matters uh, that were once in the French agenda or that were part of the national psyche have come to disappear. Within the hexagon, some blacks are currently fighting to be freely black at last. But let us not forget that here in hexagonal France, like in many other locales, <laughs> blackness is a wide category that encompasses more than just the bodies and the phenotypes that are read, that are read sorry, as black. Blackness thus needs to be understood as both a physicality and a status, political, economic, social, and legal. As such, it also includes Muslims, Arabs, Roma people, and banlieusards, the inhabitants of underprivileged suburbs. Living otherwise would require acknowledging, accepting, and working through these facts. Thank you. I will go, though I will be cutting as I go along because it's too long. Um, but I also want to thank Tina Camp, um, Kayama and Francoise, um, as well as Saidia and, and everyone else who's part of the, the working group and has done work here, um, and, and to say thank you and welcome you all. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel with people whose thinking has been so essential to my own. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Whose thinking has been so essential to my own. So the through thread of what I wanted to talk about is the work of imagination, and I was gonna talk a little bit about both of my books and then a little bit more. To think, what can and does the work of imagination do? What is the work of imagination doing? How do we survive this present? And how do we build a future from here? So black feminists around the world have long been writing a present and future, imagining and ushering liberation into being from absolute unfreedom through poetry, narrative, dance, song, film, and collective projects of undoing the current oppressive structures by imagining anti-capitalist, abolitionist, queer, non-hetero patriarchal worlds as radical breaks with the present order. So I've written in conversation with black feminist theorists, activists, writers, and artists who it seems to me are every day making black life appear and who imagine and animate black futures. We are at yet another awful crossroads with the rise of anti-black fascism all around the world. We are in the weather, in the singularity, but there's, also, there's disaster, but also possibility. So I begin again with an epigraph from Kamal Brathwaite, The Black Angel, Dream Stories 2. We were the offspring of lovers, convicts, the poor, and had been brought to this forest by the factory committee, from we born, or in some cases from infancy. Many of us were mad, some were idiots, and a few suffered from anhistamines, hysterias, vitamin deficiencies, and allergies that behave like liars, tubers, and blood pressure, diseases, result of the vicious internal breeding of our impenitential ancestors. So in my first book, I read a series of visual and written texts, African and diasporic, from the 19th century to the 21st century, that were concerned with the transactions by which one is made a subject subjected by others, and the other is a subject but the author of his own subjection, and that comes from Frederick Douglass, My Bondage and My Freedom. And the transactions were registered by conditions of violation, narrative, and other confinement of produced and reproduced shame transmitted from one generation to the next. And I argued in Monstrous Intimacies that those subjections were most readable and locatable still through the horrors enacted on the black body after slavery and the official periods of apprenticeship and emancipation through further colonialism, imperialism, the relative freedoms of segregation, desegregation, and independence, whether that black person was located in the Caribbean, the Americas, England, Europe, or post-independence Africa. So I argued that all postmodern, that all modern subjects were post-slavery subjects constituted by the discourses, the discursive codes of slavery, but that post-slavery subjectivity was large, and that post is of course not really a post, were largely born and readable on the new world black subject. And I wanted monstrous intimacies to be a means to examine the subjectivities constituted from transatlantic slavery onward, connected then as now by the everyday mundane horrors that aren't even acknowledged to be horrors. 
It was a way to articulate a diasporic study attentive to but not dependent upon nations and nationalisms linked in different forms during slavery and into the present freedoms by monstrous intimacies, which I thought of as a set of known and known performances and practices, desires and positions, reproduced, circulated, transmitted, breathed in like air, but often, as far as black people were concerned, unacknowledged to be monstrous. From those Africans forced to step over the threshold of the door of no return into Middle Passage, to their dispersal in the diaspora, entry through the bloodstained gate, new forms of subjectivity were created, not only for people of African descent in the diaspora, but for Africans, Europeans, and others. Extraordinary sites of domination and intimacy, slavery and Middle Passage were ruptures with and a suspension of the known world that initiated enormous and ongoing psychic, temporal, and bodily breaches. So I wanted to examine and account for a series of repetitions of master narratives of violence and forced submission that were read or reinscribed as consent and affection. And I wanted to think about the various ways that a black and black and body was articulated and struggling with similar, though, though experienced differently in different places, aftermaths of slavery, colonialism, segregation, independence, and freedom. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, about In the Wake. Um, and I wanted to think about the visual and the aesthetic, so I wanted to think about Daughters of the Dust, which, as we know, the night, Julie Dash's 1992 film was produced over the course of 10 years, and it came out of the politics and aesthetics that began with Dash's work as part of the LA Rebellion, along with other filmmakers like Charles Burnett and Haile Garima. And with its release, Daughters became the first film by an African-American woman to get cinematic distribution in the United States. It found an immediate audience among black women, and at the time, many other viewing audiences came to think of it as a foreign film. So I'm gonna date myself. Um, you, I, when I was younger, <laughs> I, was, I would go into Blockbuster in Philadelphia, which is where I lived when Daughters of the Dust came out. And it was housed in the foreign film section. Um, and you know, Dash says, that's great, you know, because I made the film first for black women, second for black people, third for everybody else. So it is a foreign film. And that's because Dash and cinematographer Arthur Jaffa wanted to unmake colonial optics. And that's clear from the very first shot of the film, which shows Viola Pazant, Mr. Sneed, the photographer, Yellow Mary and Trula on the boat, in which Mr. Sneed has a kaleidoscope and he tells us what kaleidoscope means. Kalos, beautiful, eidos, form, scope into sea. And so the scene establishes for the audience an entrance into a complex visual scene as it interrogates established knowledge, um, the time when slavery ended, what the archives don't record, etc. It's also in the way that the shots are slowed down from 24 to 16 frames per second, which reconfigures the way that we see. Um, and I think, as Rizvana was saying, the ways in which we are made, and Tina were saying, about the ways in which we're made to attend to the film, um, that we have to pay attention to be present um, to watch it. Because there were all kinds of very odd reviews, particularly from white feminists who said, you know, look at these black women in their Laura Ashley dresses, etc. So Dash marks slavery in the film by indigo stains on the hands. And even though she's aware that the indigo would no longer be visible 40 years after the end of chattel slavery, she chose that instead of more familiar you know, marks of slavery like whip scarred backs, brands, etc. And those kind of marks are really visible in a film like um, Steve McQueen's 12 Years a Slave. Um, and so I wanted to think about the ways in which Dash positions us to think about um, what McQueen says when he says, he, McQueen says that 12 Years a Slave is a love story. Um, and he says, I love the idea of just being in real time, being present, being there. I'm a filmmaker, so I always think, when is the breaking point? When is long enough? And so when you watch 12 Years a Slave, you think, when is the breaking point? In the, book, in the film, or for that matter, in most contemporary films in the West and their representations of black suffering. Where's the breaking point, the breath, the pause, where the circulation, production, and reception of images of black suffering and also the pleasure in them are concerned? So the long time or the long shot of the four minutes of him hanging or the beating of Patsy, um, 
sort of centers the everyday as everyday violence as continuous and gratuitous. And I think it's very different with a film like Daughters of the Dust and its visualization of black life in the decades after slavery. So I don't want to take too much more time, but I want to turn to um, the Mauritian filmmaker Abdurrahman Sisako's Timbuktu, which I think is a gorgeous film that tells a story of life lived in the imminence and imminence of death. And I think this is where we meet up. It's a story that tells about black life being lived in the midst of great duress, but of something being made and sounded in the middle of that. Um, so there's a scene where a young woman who's been caught who's been uh, caught playing music and singing in the company of another woman and two young men. and. Um, you know, so they're in a room making music, and she's sentenced to 40 lashes. And in the midst of her being beaten, she starts to sing. And um, it's this moment where sort of violence and pain is transformed into something else, not transcended, but something else is also being sounded there. And so thinking about the ways in which blackness isn't only an, in, in, an, uh, an index, uh, an indexical record of suffering, but of something being made. Um, and I, have, I had a lot more, but I'm actually going to stop with that. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to thank Tina and Saidia and uh, everyone else from the Practicing Refusal Working Group for um, making it possible, and uh, everybody else for being here. I am not refusing to speak. I'm, I'm just, um, I'm a bit overwhelmed by what just happened in Brazil. And I, um, and I have the sense that, that I can say nothing or I can never stop speaking. So, um, so that's where I'm going to um, try to um, respond to the question that Tina and Rizvana uh, gave us in a way that is, uh, it's also, I think it is, it is also a commentary on what's happening. And then, of course, we can talk about what's happening. Um, but I don't want to talk about what's happening. That's why speaking, um, it's very difficult. Um, but actually, watching AJ, AJ's film again uh, reminded me of something that then made. Uh, saying anything possible, which is something that I've been trying to, um, I've been thinking about, trying to organize in my, in my head. Um, and so far, up to now, I just have a little outline. Um, but now, after watching um, the film, it just came to me that, that it is about blackness. So I've been trying to uh, think about what I call a transformative theory of justice. And this is a course, I give, uh, it's my graduate course, and I have taught it three times. This is the fourth time. And the previous three times, I had no idea what I was trying to do. I just got the students to read all the boring philosophy that I could get them to read, and some interesting texts. Um, but then this year, something happened. Um, I was asked, uh, yes, I was asked to write a foreword for a book on, um, by a family uh, who lives in Vancouver, where I'm located now. And the book is a love letter to, to the city, but it is also written out of the, the recognition that the family itself is a settler family, is a white family living on unceded uh, First Nations indigenous land. And as I was, as I finished the love letter and could appreciate the impossibility of loving uh, so much violence, um, I started th thinking about, okay, so what does it take uh, to be, to even conceive of justice when, when one occupies uh, such a position? So what came to me was these four um, elements that, that any uh, transformative theory of justice, and the transformative theory of justice kind of like a contradiction, but let's not go there. Um, what are the elements that it should, should have? And I thought it should be radical, uh, so it should call for the end of the world, confrontational, confrontational being it should acknowledge uh, the violence that makes possible to live in this case, in, in our case in Vancouver, on a ceded land, but at, at the same time should include a commitment to not reproduce that violence. 
it should be critical um, because I don't think we can just move on towards a different world before going through and ex exposing and dissolving all that enters in the making of this one, but then it has to be at the same time poetical. So we have to live in the world as if it is already otherwise. And uh, AJ's film, sh to me, shows blackness at all four uh, happening at the same time. So when Tina was talking about the effective labor that it takes, it, but all the emotions, right? It is the smiling, the cry. I was crying as I was, I was watching it, uh, and all those elements. So, in a way, I just found out, figured out what I, um, what obviously it was implicit in what I have been writing about in terms of black feminist poetics, um, which. So the, the question of blackness and futurity, which is one I cannot answer because I want to end time, <laughs> it's already living at the end, at the end of the world, living as if, um, but really living as if it, another life, um, it's possible. And, and I have been trying, to, I have been experimenting, I shouldn't say trying, I have been experimenting, experimenting with different ways of actually deploying blackness towards um, thinking the world anew. Um, and I have to say that thinking, I find thinking very crucial. And what's happening in Brazil, this now also reminds me how, of how crucial it is. But I'm not going to bug you with the principle of non-contradiction and the law of identity. Um, I'm just going to talk about two things that also, um, that have been, I have been playing with as a way of trying to tease my, my imagination and others' imagination in terms of how do we live poetically, how do we live as if the world has already ended and the other one has begun. Um, so one of them is black light, um, which is an image that I um, initially thought as a tool for critique. Um, black light, ultraviolet, ultraviolet radiation, right? Um, so maybe I should tell you about the spectrum. Maybe the spectrum is better. So we know that is this, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the tiny band is visible light, is what we see, and then most of it is outside. I haven't memorized them all, but I'm, I'm interested in the two extremes that are closer to um, the visible light. One is ultraviolet radiation, which is high frequency up there, purple, and the other one is infrared, which is low frequency at the bottom. Um, I started playing with um, black light, ultraviolet radiation, by thinking about, by activating blackness to refer to a mode of thinking that not only does the critical work, which is exposing how things are put together and the, the, and the limitations of that put together, but exposing in such a way that will lead to the destruction of what it exposes. Because you know that ultraviolet radiation, it can uh, alter DNA, right? Hence, it causes uh, cancer. So black light has uh, the capacity to um, dissolve the very uh, abstract, but then at the same time, very concrete um, ideas and terms and formulations that organize our lives. Um, so that would be more of the critical moment. And in, in thinking in terms of uh, the poetical moment, I have now playing with, been playing with um, radical immanence, which is, to me, a figuring of the infrared. So you know that everything at the room temperature emits infrared uh, radiation, right? Um, so that's why they, you know, they use it for surveillance and capturing things. But to me, the question with, with infrared or radical immanence is a question which leads uh, to the plenum, uh, which has to do with Another question that, in a way, I think um, maybe undermines which undermines literal temp uh, linear, sorry, linear temporality, which is the question: Is what if we image existence as fire? 
um, what if we image existence as uh, electromagnetic radiation? What if we image existence from taking into account both the quantic, the very tiny little thing, uh, particles of which everything is uh, constituted, and the cosmic, that which we can even uh, con that which we can't even conceive because it's just unimaginable. What if we could um, begin? We could exist, attending to the fact that we exist at all at those two dimensions, all and at once. And there was something else that I was going to say, but I'm not going to say it. I'll say it later. Thank you for the patience. Well, thank you. Thank you, of course, to Tina and to uh, Mabula and Kayama, and also to whom I have admired for so long. You know, so I'm very glad, and to everyone who is here, it's very nice. It's very important. Um, the the question that Tina raised is: every morning, you know, I'm thinking, I wake up and I I am uh, drawn, and there are so many incredible news that. Well, effectively raise the question of what is the future, you know, what is the future, because the present, it seems to me that quite often the past is our future right now, the past of genocide and, and slavery is not the past, is there with us and in front of us. So then it's this constant, you know, global counter-revolution um, and the victory everywhere around the world, and of course uh, the last one, which is really make us pause, you know, of right wing, and we see it in Europe also, in Italy, in Poland, in Hungary, uh, in India, in everywhere, of racist, homophobic, um, anti-Semitic, uh, transphobic, anti-indigenous right, Islamophobic. Um, and whose victory is made also possible because it's supported by capital, by business, and by uh, fundamental churches. So this alliance between state, capital, right-wing forces, in a way that you know, are unexpected, and they don't necessarily get along, but they get along for one thing, so that they want effectively make do profit and kill people. And the way in which the right to kill and the right to maim, which is not quite the same thing, have become widely accepted, absolutely widely accepted. So um, this is uh, effectively uh, our present. And uh, the black body is not just make disposable, um, but is the death and destruction is both more visible than ever because of social network, media, and everything, and more invisible than ever at the same time. It does not produce um, a kind of a, a, a aura almost. It's become, it's the, it has the possibility of naturalizing and banalizing that. The more you see it, the less you see it, in fact. The death in the Mediterranean, for instance, has not stopped the fact that millions of Europeans go to the beach in summer in the Mediterranean and swim in the middle of the dead body of African who die there every day. So their lives are not reality. They can be effectively the place where children play and uh, people learn to swim and, and go snorkeling. Um, and it's important, and even it seems uh, I was thinking about that, and the fact that even not only the, the deaths are made visible, but invisible, but also the criminalization of solidarity, which is very, very present. It goes even through the law, the fact that you cannot save people who are drowning, because then you are judged as accomplice of smugglers. So how effectively a simple gesture, which is the human gesture, to help someone who is drowning, which has been the millenary right of the sea, that you know, whatever that person you save is now criminalized. So how do we understand that humanness is no longer effectively part of what is to be human in the world? 
And, um, and the simple even gesture offering water also to a migrant or refugee is being a crime, is making a crime. And I thought a lot about this question of, you know, water becoming a crime, offering water. And um, I read a, a while back a poem by uh, the South African poet uh, Koleka Putuma, who is called Water, and which has been very important for me, let me think. I will read to you just two paragraphs, don't worry. Um, but it's very, so what, I mean, paragraphs I think will uh, have helped me for tonight. Our respect for water is what you have termed fear. The audacity to trade and murder us over water, then mock us for being scared of it. The audacity to arrive by water and invade us. We never consent when we are asked to dine with the oppressors and serve them forgiveness. How when the only ingredient I have are grief and rage? And this for me, you know, the, the question of like the water being effectively the place. I mean, water being both what saves us as human, because we, without water we die, we die much more quickly of thirst and of hunger. And the relation with water as a site of death for the black body, it was important for me. And, um, and she has a sentence also in the poem, and she say, and we are, we can all thereafter wash this bitter meal with amnesia. And this is what is being produced, that we have to drink the bitter poisoned water, and then this gesture is being, you know, washed with amnesia by Europe and the white people. Even the fact that so many, again, so many bodies, you know, black bodies are washed in the Mediterranean and in the Indian Ocean, as you reminded us, and I've not even pro produced an incredible reflection on slave trade and slavery. Is for me um, really uh, show that slavery, slave trade and slavery have not yet become history. There are still something that is being told about, but it's not history in the sense that the way it has shaped the world we live in still. And to say two things about France, since we are in France. I mean, the question of water, for instance, and I call water, for me, salt water, or you know, or drinking water, the question of water. France, thanks to slavery and the colonial empire, is still today the second maritime power in the world, most important maritime, just after the US. And this was, this, position was given to France because of slave trade, slavery, and colonialism. But then today, it presents itself at the country being on five continents, you know, in five ocean, and, and of totally forgetting the people who are living in this territory and who are still the colonized, because uh, we are not, France is not yet a post-colonial country, right? There is still Tahiti, New Caledonia, Guyana, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Mayotte, and Réunion. But this amnesia is very important. And the boomerang effect, which Césaire talked about in discourse on colonialism, the fact that, that if you enslave, if you colonize, it will come back to you. And this is coming back very much so today in France. But the, most of the society of does not even want to see that this is a boomerang effect of the century of enslaving and colonizing and current imperialist intervention everywhere. So this amnesia is very constitutive and this refusal, this, which produces a, 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 a French innocence, you know, we are innocent of that, we, are, we, we did not do that. Some people did it, they were not quite French. France was, you know, the, is a good country. And uh, this has, has absolutely contaminated the left, feminism, leftism, very deeply. So it raised the question of with whom to work, who are their allies, you know, with whom to work in this country. I mean, feminism, French feminism is totally contaminated, but does not know it at all. White French feminists have no clue, no clue whatsoever 
and about the way in which they have been constituted and feminism, not, not white women only, but French feminism has been constituted because of slavery and because of colonialism. They have no understanding of that. And I just wanted to give an, uh, just something about this year that you know about this, this incredible that produce. At the beginning of the year, um, uh, the woman, uh, woman of uh, black woman who work, uh, who clean the Gare du Nord, uh, had a strike, uh, you know, strike and uh, won. You know, they had victory against. They were, of course, and uh, underpaid and uh, harassed constantly on the job. So they had like 45 days of strike and they won. At the same moment, there was this petition, I mean, this tribune by uh, Catherine Deneuve and others, you know, asking to be, uh, so that they could be freely, you know, put, uh, that men could touch them in the subway freely because, you know, that the media and the feminists, I mean, some, a lot of feminists, white feminists, in, jump on that. And there was a controversy every day on radio and television, yes, no, yes, no, whatever. Nothing about the strike, nothing. And it was very interesting for me because that strike bring together, if we look at it, the question of the fact that women, black women, clean the world every day. And without cleaning the world, the society will not work. Office will not be able to open, bank, school, hospital, university, the place we are in to, the, tonight. But this work, which is absolutely indispensable, has to be made invisible. And this is really a legacy of slavery, still today. The fact that millions of women every day around the world clean the world for capital to function. And this is invisible, absolutely, as to women. They go, they arrive at night, or they arrive very early in the morning, and um, they don't, and it's, it's also uh, a, an economy of using their body. I mean, making people so tired, so tired that they cannot do anything. I was reading testimony because I also met some women. They sleep four hours every night because they have a trial. And that for me was very also interesting. The, the, the economy that forbid you to sleep and then forbid you to dream and put your body on constant fatigue, and that fatigue is absolutely inseparable of capitalism. Capitalism has to produce for some people leisure and time, and for others a constant use of the body. And that's also for me the echo of slavery. So it brings together that strife, we brought together the question of health, the question of also chemical industry, because they use a lot of chemical and they have, of course, a lot of problem with that. The invisibility yet the absolute necessity of that work. So this was, for me, uh, made me think about all, all, all this. And uh, so the black fraternity will be the right to dream and the right to be a uh, human in the world. But it also will question the temporality of the Western narrative of emancipation. That, you know, it's one day, the cut, the rupture, you know, the Bastille, you know, the storm of the Bastille, or the Winter Palace, or whatever, or the day of Indep Independence Day, and when they puff, this arrive. And I think that we have really to challenge that, spa that temporality. Um, the time and, and, and space of liberation and emancipation are different, have always been different, and remain different. They are about, it's about day after the struggle, which is silent and noisy, visible and invisible, you know, slow and fast, constantly, full of joy and despair. And therefore, thus, the, the notion of defeat, which is so central in European, you know, narrative of emancipation, victory and defeat, has to be questioned. In Europe, it brings the idea of defeat, brings the idea of fragility and therefore of deep resentment of having shown, I've been shown the fragility. So hatred and resentment are very, but if it is what, what one expects when one is fighting with his enemy, right? And it's a source of reflection and bringing back, you know, the energy to fight again. You know, it's not, it's just, you know, it's a long road to freedom, it's not a moment of stop. 
So the right to dream when murder is normalized and um, going, you know, what I've been naturalized. Because I'm always thinking, you know, because uh, in, when in France I talk about the memory of slavery, and uh, uh, why, why, why did not revolt? Why did not do, you know, whatever? I say no. The question would be more: Why did you consent to it for so long? Why did you consent to it for so long, for so four centuries? So what happened? How did you make it so natural, so normal, that it took so long? But for the slave, it was never normal and natural. It was never like day and night. They always fought. It was never a moment where they did not fought. So today, when neoliberalism, uh, neoliberal capitalism with its fascist component is telling us that there is no alternative, that is as natural and day and night, well, we can say, and this is you know, what the, we have learned, we have been taught, that there is an alternative is a radical promise of black futurity, you know, of being here and today human in the world. Thank you. I suppose I should have anticipated that you all would, would mess with my questions uh, by answering many of them, by making others irrelevant, and um, by making me want to ask different ones. So I'm just going to try here. Um, to start with, okay, something simple like time uh, and temporality. The, the thing that messed with me just now is that I was going to say that one of my concerns in these conversations around black futurity is that in principle, de facto, the future never is. Um, it's technically always this thing that is in front of us and therefore can become something that is imagined as utopian or filled with possibility, et cetera. But of course, Francoise talked, started by reminding us that this pathological present is the future of a pathological past. So the future is, it is always. And so I'm hoping that now you can help me fix my thinking about time or something by picking up um, where Francoise has, has brought us to, you know, are there dangers to this concept of futurity? Is it leading us perhaps in a direction that doesn't appropriately address um, the black present. Okay, the end of your question. I, I don't know if there is any danger um, in the sense of black futurity. Um, I think, and I think Francoise uh, also mentioned it, I think there is a problem in continuing to think not only blackness, but also to think the world in the logic of revolution and emancipation and that some, somehow something will happen and things will no longer be uh, as they were before. Um, so I think that's the problem. Now, to the extent that the future is living some other way, not this life, then there is no danger, it is, it is what we want, right? But then, but I'm the one who writes against time anyway. So I think, <laughs> um, given the, those responses, um, what, what concerns me is something that I think we, we want to pay attention is precisely at the regularity of the racial event, which is a regularity with which um, racial violence, con the regularity of racial violence, but at the same time the regularity that it's, that it's not never the same, right? So now at this moment, global capital are activating what we take as the enemy of liberal, the liberal, liberal infrastructures, which is fascism. But the fact is that for indigenous people, for black people, for women and all of us, uh, the liberal infrastructures has nev have never been but violent anyway. Um, so in the same way that I think we, we I agree that we should uh, try and not think in uh, in, uh, with linear temporality, assuming that something else will happen, we also have to attend to the regularity of the violence and what actually makes it possible, which in my, in my view is the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's the same uh, basic way of thinking, 
principle of non-contradiction that prevents us from seeing how everything is at the same time itself and not itself um, because it is both a continuity but also a combination of everything else that exists at the same time. Um, so if we can, the moment we start to attend to the moment and to this more complex aspect of living, then everything becomes possible, right? Because then you can go up, down, back, and forth, and reach beyond beyond anything. And that's, you know, being able to think along those lines will uh, then um, free us from the traps of futurity. And then I think at the same time from the illusion that the past has uh, already happened. Um, I was talking with them, with somebody, a, a physicist, because I'm part of a group with the, um, some quantum physicists in um, Vancouver, and he was reminding the group of the fact that whenever we see something out in space, like a supernova, uh, we are able to see, I mean, the instruments are able to capture what's ha what has happened, I don't know, six billion years ago, uh, because the instruments are able to do so, but we have no idea of what has become of it. Uh, we only know what has become of it once we have instruments that will show us. So the past is in the future, right? Um, so if we could just think that way, maybe mm -hmm. some shifts would take place. Mm -hmm. um, I just came from a, a conference on um, silencing the past, Michel Rothtrail, silencing mm -hmm. the past at 25. And so I thought that I'm probably not going to quote it exactly, but when Toyo says, you know, pastness is a position, we can in no way say that the past is past. Um, and as you were talking about physics, um, maybe you can help me. Is it, what is it, is it that one, by the time that we experience light, it has, it, we are actually experiencing the past of, um, so thinking about the ways in which the, the past and present are completely, um, Inter interwoven. Um, I was thinking about um, the election of Bolsonaro and thinking about questions of capital and how you've how you've said you know the sort of liberal order is also violence. It's all violence. But immediately, because I now live in Canada, immediately um, uh, the CBC reported that at least I don't remember who said it that you know Canada is open for business. You know we look forward to doing business with this new government, right? So that so that for us. Each state has been a state of violence. Um, I'll stop with that. Um, I, I, I think it's important also what you said, and the fact that um, be careful about uh, this opposition in in which you know liberal versus fascism. Uh, for me, there is like the polite way of murdering versus the vulgar way of murdering, right? And uh, I know, for instance, I, I was in the state last year, and the obsession by liberal about Trump was, you know, you should get a clue, you know, like because, okay, here, I mean, in France, effectively, we have a president, he finishes sentences, he, you know, <laughs> his wife is older and not younger, he was supposedly the friend of philosopher, uh, you know, he's young, he dress, he does not have a long red tie that, you know, okay. He does not have orange hair. So, uh, so it's all good. I can tell you that in, right now, there is a series of low paths there, which are, you know, like terrible for migrant, refugee, the laws of, of surveillance, I mean, a, a series of things. So we should not stop at this polite versus non-polite things. If it is. So I, I agree with you. And on the question of also this uh, regularity of violence, um, and um, how do we uh, think of it? Because it's both uh, uh, what we have seen before and, and, uh, and not quite that. Um, and uh, there is also, perhaps, uh, um, there is something about it also. I, I do think that there is a, a feeling that it's reaching all every little corner of the world. There is no space, none, that is escaping it. So that. That's part of the new things that the, the fact that there is no 
place almost to hide. So what do we do facing the regularity of violence where apparently there is no pla place to hide anymore? I was, I, uh, for me, for instance, the Maroon have always been something that, you know, like, uh, like the, 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 in the, in the, darkness of time people were doing. And I wasn't thinking, where do we gonna maroon? You know, where are we gonna, gonna but at the same time I do think that there was a possibility. So it's yes, it's this uh, uh, tension. Thank you. Just to be clear, Kayama, can you rephrase the, <laughs> the question <laughs> for a, me? A tricky move. <laughs> Gives giving me more time to reflect. Yeah, exactly. no, I, uh, my question was ended up being um, is there something concerning about imagining black futurity as an aspirational potentially utopian place that we will ultimately get to but of, co of course it is always deferred because it is always future mm -hmm. um, but then I said that was the wrong question because Francoise had so aptly reminded us that the future is the or rather the present is the future of a pathological past. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I restated my same question really, which was, uh, do we see any problem with kind of coining this notion of black futurity? Is it perhaps misleading? Um, and in that way, maybe not as productive as we might want it to be. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think that uh, the idea of a black futurity is misleading. I think I would even say that that's, that's all we have. And I hope that we can, I think earlier when, when uh, Tina opened um, tonight's event, um, she asked us to perhaps allow ourselves um, to dream. And I think that when I heard those words, I felt that dreaming to me today seemed kind of a luxury, right? To say I don't have, I don't have the luxury, the time, uh, the privilege to dream. But still, we dream. That, that's all we have. And that's, that I think that dreams throughout the history of the African diaspora have been powerful, powerful enough and have, if we, we need to go back to the past, those dreams, um, whether they were uh, you know, maroon communities, if we think of the uh, emigration movements in the United States, if we think of Liberia, even with the you know, foundational problems that um, um, Liberia um, came out of, if we think of uh, the dream of repatriation of Rastafari, um, I think that there were always problems in those um, either communities, nation states that were created, um, you know, projects that were launched, but still people at least invested those spaces, those projects, those ter territories, and tried to do something, and they moved. That made people move. Um, I happen to know more about uh, Rastafari, for instance, and people always, when they lightly approach the topic, they will say, why would anyone believe in the divinity of Haile Selassie of Ethiopia? And I think that is not the correct question. The more interesting question could be, how can this powerful narrative um, made people cross in reverse, right? Cross the Atlantic to go back to Ethiopia, which was not even the place where they were supposed to come from. That's not the, that's not the idea. You cannot use only rationality and say you were coming from Senegambia or you were coming from Central Africa and you ended up in Jamaica or you ended up in North America. So, you know, this is, this is not only about, you know, rationality or even the DNA testing that we're doing today. I think that the, the, the power of those narratives gave some, um, yes, freedom to, to, to the people who clung to that. Um, another example that I like to use is that, that of the, the Nation of Islam in the, in, in the US. And people, if you look at the, um, you know, how do you say, the, the, not the, but the, the myth of the Nation of Islam and the construction of the world and the, the, the planet that exploded and the two sides. Some people might read it and say, this is crazy, this is absolutely nonsense, right? Some people might say that, some people have said that, some people have problems with Farrakhan's and they can have problems with um, Farrakhan to this day. But the fact is that the Nation of Islam has existed since 1930, that there have been attempts made by the members of the Nation of Islam to make this organization 
more uh, orthodox in the 70s after the, uh, the death of Elijah Muhammad, and this didn't work. They had to go back to the basic, the basic tenets of the ideology of the Nation of Islam because it served a purpose. And people who believed in those tenets needed those tenets, and they needed to organize their lives accord, um, accordingly. So I think that, um, perhaps to go back to, the, to, to your original question, that the, um, I think dreams are free, and that matters. Dreams are free, mm -hmm. therefore they are accessible. And I think that the, the psyche, uh, we, we have spoken about slavery and we have spoken about you know, colonialism and the entrapment of bodies. But I wanna say thank God, there are, you know, it's bodies, but there are minds, right? And, 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 and the resistance has occurred a lot through the, the workings of, of the minds. And that matters, that's important. I, I don't know if this is much of an addition, but but you know I, I I have to quote the thing that I always quote, and it's from Toni Morrison's Beloved and Baby Suggs in the Clearing, who says, "If you cannot see it, you will not have it." And so the power of imagination, both to see that that we are already in the midst of all kinds of pressure pressures, living some otherwise, and to make a leap into something else. So I think I think that. Um, the danger is in a deferral of imagination, a deferral of of um, of trying to make a, a, a livable world. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps I was a little too tense uh, at first, <laughs> Tina, when I thought I don't have time to dream, but we dream all the time. <laughs> Academics dream. That's what we do. That's that that's we are professional dreamers, right? <laughs> Um, I am not a terribly rigorous timekeeper. Can I have one more question and then open up? Just okay. one. Yeah? All right. <laughs> Just one. All right. Are you sure, Tina? Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm going to take you up on that. Um, so I have a question. Um, this time, thanks to you, Mabula, starting us off in French. Um, I have a question about translation and the capacity. The capaciousness, let's say, of blackness, in quotes, as a word and as a concept, it strikes me, obviously, that we're five people up here on this stage representing five different points in the African diaspora, Brazil, the US, Afro-Caribbean, Réunion, and France, um, among other places. Um, and we're all speaking in English, but there's this buzzing in my ear, and it's the translators that are doing the simultaneous translation. And I'm thinking, OK, so this is that necessary interruption in a literal sense, but also perhaps in a metaphorical sense as we're trying to create community and think diasporically, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, all the conversations we've been having, Kina and I, about, well, what do we get translated? How much does it cost? Um, who really needs it? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So all to ask, then, what would, uh, here I am again with the dangers and the obstacles, but yes, using blackness as our term of operation, um, are there concerns at all that that word or concept doesn't translate well. Um, and this question I ask also, Mabula and I have, tra have translated, have taught a class together a couple of times, or, or one time, but I've had her in this class a second time, where the students who are American have asked, well, if blackness is such a capacious category, well, what happens to the specificity of me being black? If we're gonna say, marginalization writ large is synonymous with blackness or vice versa, what's then the danger of expanding that category too broadly? So I feel like now I've asked a few questions, but it's about this word blackness and its capaciousness as perhaps um, problematic or untranslatable, one way or the other. Um, I'll begin, <laughs> if I may. Um, <laughs> but I have the mic, so I have the power. <laughs> Um, um, trying to be funny about it because this is not a funny question. This is actually very complex. I think that when we're talking about the stakes of translation, we are really at the, the heart of the matter and we are, the, the question is how, is how to deal with the inherent complexity of this African diaspora. And we are talking simultaneously about the, the sameness, sameness of the experiences, but also the specificities of the locations, right? So if, if we you know, very easily accept this model of the Black Atlantic and that leaves the um, Indian Ocean, and I know that, but if we, um, we, we, we take the Black, the Black Atlantic as this general space, 
which is constituted of multiple you know, locales, how do you find the right balance, right? So I think that what we have discussed, uh, discussed so far has shown that the experience of blackness um, has been global and, 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 and is identical. It's identical even to the point when, um, I remember when Christina Sharp spoke about uh, Daughters of the Dust and how it had been categorized as a foreign movie. It immediately made me think of a, a director, a French director of Algerian origin here, whose name is um, uh, Rashid Jaidani, and who had a, um, a, a movie that was kind of a, a small budget movie, but that got a lot of critic at attention, that was eight years in the making. Uh, and that was also categorized in the foreign section uh, the day I went to a store to, 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 to get uh, the DVD. So, so these uh, similarities exist. But then languages come into play. Uh, languages come into play. And one of the problems that we've been uh, dealing with recently, even though it's an old question, has been the translation of blackness. I don't know what the translator has used so far. <laughs> that would be very interesting. Uh, to know, because this... Identité noire. Très, très bien. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> oui, l'identité noire. Uh, um, l'identité noire, okay. So, but there is so much, there is so much at stake in the translation. There is so much at stake in who gets translated, who is worthy enough of a translation, who is, you know, the, 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 one of the latest examples was Tanaisi Coates. Uh, whose, uh, whose book, Between the World and Me, um, the title of which comes from a beautiful poem by Richard Wright, right, that gets totally um, invisibilized in France and, and, and gets translated as an, une colère noire, like black anger, black rage, black rage, right? How do you do that and what does it mean well, to and make then, this translation? And then do you remember the, the translation into Dutch? Yes. When it was on the cover of that Dutch magazine mm -hmm. and it used the epithet? Uh, Oh, well, if I had my computer in front of me, I would bring it up and show you, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So, so, so these it, questions of translation. Yes, yeah, so who gets um, published, I mean, not, not published, but translated, worthy enough of attention. Uh, if you think of Marlon James, for instance, A Brief History of Seven Killings, what do you make of the pages, of the multiple pages of uh, Jamaican Patois? And who in France, because I looked at the, 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 the translation in France, who will be, um, knowledgeable enough, which means educated enough in, 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 in the, um, you know, how you, you are taught translation in France, what are the curricula, what are the canons, right? And what will make you a certified translator who will then have the rights to translate anything, including the works of the, of the African diaspora, right? Even though we are talking about, um, a diaspora that includes subjects that are invisible, that are not worthy of being studied. So how do you teach that? And how do you practice that professionally? So I think that um, the issue of translation is very important, not because of the experiences, because the experiences have been global and we, the, the experiences are the same. The languages, which is also the languages are the reflections of the powers that organize this world as we know it today. Um, it's, it's, I think it's um, the linguistic battle, the, 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 the battle for translation is as important as the others. And Kyle, as it, it seemed like you were also asking about two kind, right, the, the kind of translation from one language to another, but also the translation, does black itself as a category of being uh, translate, move across space? And, and, and I would say yes, as distinct from culture, that blackness as a category of human to whom anything can be done. Is the sort of blackness as a category of the human to whom anything can be done, right? As distinct from, and of African descent, I mean, I, I, I am linking blackness, though, I, though in my own work I talk about somebody being blackened, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to be adjacent to those people of African descent. And, but you may move in and out of a category of being blackened, right? So that you may then still be able to um, 
to exercise a particular kind of power over people who are of African descent and black, right? So I, I wanted to think about that sort of category of, of dehumaned person, as opposed to the, the sort of the issue that is also important of the kind of, of, of translation from one language to another, and sort of what language is the, the language that, one, that we're speaking in English and translating into French. And we, we, could, we could be speaking in French and translating into English. Though I would not be speaking. I understood also your question, but perhaps I'm, it, it's not just about you know the translation, but it's also about overcoming the division that is being produced. Uh, you know, to to divide people. You know, um, um, uh, so um, it's not just about translating a word into another language. It's also about overcoming the division that are supposedly produced by language or something. And so how do you build a transnational subaltern internationalism that, you know, make you, um, you don't need to know, you don't need to speak that language to feel close. That, that's part of the, that's part of, a, for me, you know, black futurity and black dream and black hope, you know, Esperance. It's, it's it, that it's not just a, that I have to understand the world is like uh, it's it's overcoming the division and for me and it's it's being in solidarity uh, automatically uh, and has nothing to I don't need to understand what people say uh, to to know that in that situation on which side I'm going to be um, that's what and and also. Um, I was thinking that translation, I mean, the way I understand your question, is not so much to, to produce transparency, but even, you know, that it's, it's important to have foreignness, you know, to, to be, to, to, to make, uh, that people make feel, you feel foreign. We, I mean, this uh, aspiration to transparency and to understand everything in the world, that the world should be understandable to everyone. I travel, I, I need to everything, I need my Google translation and so on. That's a Western constant idea of colonization. Everything has to be known. Everything has to become under a window and I can look at it. And I think that, you know, that, that blackness as translation should be that, yes, we can be foreign and we can be made foreigners. Because we are not, you know, colonizer. The colonizer want to understand everything, to index everything, to, you know, like everything we have. And this is not, I think, what we aspire to. So that would be my two remark about translation. Yeah, I just have a, a quick commentary on the complexity of the term itself, right? Because as, um, as me, already said, we have the, the category itself, which does its work. And it may be the, the one that it's transparent, right, when it does the work of, of, of racial violence. We have um, blackness, the, well, I shouldn't use blackness, we have the, the social historical trajectories of people of African descent and also of people in the in the continent. And then we have blackness as we are deploying it here, which when it's translated into black identity, because that identity noir is something else completely different. <laughs> right? We are speaking two things. We are using blackness in one sense and it's being translated in a yeah, in a different way. So we have to live with that complexity too, because there is no other way of translating it, right? So whatever we are talking about is in between blackness in the register that we are attempting to get and blackness as an identity. So I just want to call attention to it. I have other questions that I will ask if other people um, don't have questions, but fair game. Who has a question, please raise your hand. And I think we've got past microphones, yes? I live in Los Angeles, California. Um, I just finished hosting a, being an English speaking host at a web festival. And I want to go back to this translation because I was doing a poem and I had to give the translator a copy of my poem so that it would help him with the translation a little bit because the poem had a little, it was in, it was basic English, but it had a little, some references that related to black culture 
that he may not have gotten had I not given him the peace. So with all the translation that's going on, what are recommendations to help get better translations so that we can understand each other when it comes to this whole cultural thing? I'm going to use that word. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Saidia, has, you have an answer, Saidia? A different question. Does anyone want to attempt an answer? How to get better translation, how to do better at culturally translating? Yes. No, I, no. Um, I don't know how to get better translations, but maybe having lots of footnotes and living with the ambiguity. The, precari yeah, the precariousness of the translation. I don't think that is a bad translation. It's impossible, isn't it? Pass it around. I, no, I was just going to add, there's a very, if, if you're interested literally in like the how-to, there is a, a very, and you know, John Keane, obviously, yes. right, who writes, one of the things that he says about yeah. addressing this issue of getting better translation is that we need more translators of color, not because their skin is going to make them translate better, but because of exactly what we're talking about in terms of the experiential and the refusal to ignore um, context as you're working with text. John Keane, -E -E. he's a, -E -E. He's a, a brilliant poet, poet and novelist. Essayist, novelist, translator. He wrote a, he wrote a beautiful uh, book called Counter Narratives. He's also a translator. So he's thought deeply and explicitly about that very question. Yeah. So I think I was I was about to say um, the same the same thing more or less, but it's really about uh, perhaps trusting people who are not the professional and certified translators. Sorry for the translator for tonight, but what, <laughs> but what I'm, I'm I'm saying is that yes, this matter of um, you know, it, it's about the alternative. It's about the alternative. It's about what is um, not official, what is not mainstream. And I think that there's worth to be found in, in, in the ones who didn't get the jobs, who didn't get the salary, who didn't get the degree, because they were working on something else and, and putting all their work and energy and knowledge into something else. And there's a craft that they honed. And, and I think th these are the people that need to be trusted those who are not classically trained because the classical training will not train them in, that ma in, in, in those matters. So uh, thank you all for those wonderful remarks. And um, I, just have, I have a question about the character of our work now at this moment, particularly when um, given the fascist character of this moment, Many of us are being pressured to do the work of trying to save a liberal project that has always been the address where we're kind of violated anyway. So how does one do a certain kind of work which is not about saving that project to save ourselves at this moment? Um, so if each of you could speak to that. So, sorry, can you repeat the end? Sorry. Well, just thinking about the character of what that work is, because the language of emergency and crisis means we all have to band together to save this liberal project against the fascist threat. But if thinking about these recurring kinds of racial violence and the kind of the oscillation between liberal and fascist states and the fact that kind of black life remains disposable, precarious, violated throughout. How do we define our work at this moment? I mean, how do we, how do we in, in the world in practical ways that are sustaining? So I just wanted to kind of hear more from you about some of those things. This is the question, isn't it? Ouch. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm such a pessimist right now. I, so, I think I'll answer out of my pessimism, but but it is a it's a pessimism that is also, in a way, um, <clears throat> influenced and hence not so as pessimist by some um, some experiences I have had. Maybe not some experience, some some moments. I, I was in Berlin like two days ago, three days ago, and some of the people who are there are here too, <laughs> um, and we all. 
with a group of artists and um, academics and curators, and we are talking precisely about how to continue to do the work um, under such conditions, and then at the same time with the expectation that as the liberal state has now outsourced its instruments of violence, then we are also facing the danger of being attacked by anyone, right? I mean, not only by the state. And um, we, do, we didn't have a solution, but in, it was all about planning. How do you plan to uh, not only, not so, much, not so much to defend yourself, but to defend each other? How do you plan uh, not expecting that the resources will be given to you, but actually that we will have to maybe live a double life of sustaining self-organized ways and then at the same time working and having a job and all those things, doing, doing the business as usual. I think we, it's about planning, right? I mean, it's about, um, and, in a, and in a way it's not impossible because the fact that we are here now, I'm talking about the black people in the room, is because many others planned to live and continue to live under impossible circumstances without actually, absolutely, completely without outside the liberal structures because those were sustained by uh, slave labor and, and expropriation of, of lands. Yeah, I think we have to stop and think. Um, one of the things I had prepared for today was a question, how to formulate the question to be asked in the present. And I couldn't present it because I didn't finish it because that's one of the questions, right? Um, I think maybe we can't formulate the question properly. We have to start asking precisely how do we do it without. Uh, and I remember responding to something that Tavia had on Facebook that reminded me <laughs> of the, the task, which was, um, so you're going over like the liberal structures, all, the, all those rights that we are losing now. Um, and then it just hit me and it came, because he asked me, where have you written about it? It's like, no, I'm responding to a post. <laughs> it's like, we've got to stop this right to, uh, no, as a right, um, I, the distinction I was making, the right to property, whatever, which he was talking about, uh, and the right for existence. So the basic, the basic right. This has never been a right because it was always something assumed to be given by, by the divine. But I think that's, and the, if we think in terms of the right for existence, and existence always thought as collective, as everybody's and everything existence, then I think we will prepare. We, we'll be able to get prepared uh, and plan. Could you ask the question again? It's not, I, literally, it's got, yeah. <laughs> it's not a stalling. No. Um. <laughs> Um, so it was really about the character of our work now, and given um, you know the, the terms we share, um, and knowing that we're not going to be saved, even if we can save the liberal project, given the kind of historic constitutive violence of that project, we know that. So we know that's not going to save us. But with this impending fascism, there's been a lot of pressure on those who have said, oh, we're, that's not where we're going to make our investments, right? And so I was just thinking about, and so then what is the character of that other work that we're to do in this moment? Mm -hmm. And just asking you to, you to reflect on that. Okay. Um, perhaps um, just a few words. I think that, I think this question is, is both uh, tricky and interesting because to me it brings us back to um, to what we discussed previously in our relationship to the past, and we spoke about the pathological past, and that is the future of, uh, that is actually the future of our present. Uh, but I think that this moment of urgency is, um, is real, but I, but I tend to equate blackness with dealing with urgency, and that this moment, even though it is specific, it is not new. And so if we go back to the past and what we have learned and what we have studied and what we are still trying to understand, maybe this past can be 
um, can bring us some type of comfort to simply continue to continue, um, that is to say, to produce, to teach, to, pu to publish, to translate, um, to, to stand firm, even though um, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, I'm fully taking into account, um, you know, the fatigue and the exhaustion, but I think that those moments of crisis are precisely the moment when our work really matters. Like it matters. Um, there can there can be no question about uh, about the the centrality of what we do. And I think that staying alive and staying productive is already um, is already a feat in this moment of um, of urgency. But I think that there have been there have been moments. There has been a series of moments of urgency. And this is like the management of urgency seems to be what what it's what it's about, and I think that we are not. Let's say this generation is not the first generation to have to deal with, with that urgency. We have a couple of questions so, over here and one over there, so I just want to flag those. Yeah. Okay, um, so it's a, I mean it's a question that I'm preoccupied with. Um, but it's also a question that, so uh, the, uh, you know, that in your question, I'm going to I'm going to translate the hour as sort of black black you know black people, um, because I think that's the only way I can answer it is to say that the hour you know uh, what is who what is our black people's work now, um, and so the now is also a question of you know like the the catastrophe's been ongoing, um, it feels more more urgent. I don't know that I really have an answer, except that it is something that I'm preoccupied with. Um, and that I think, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to reference a conference that I just came from, but part of the work I think can't be the work of disciplining people into <coughs> producing work in line with a particular discipline. Um, if we're talking about black people in the academy, um, I think that it has, there has to be a space, I mean, if not now, when can you take a certain kind of chance to do the work that you really want to do, or to speak what you need to speak? Because, you know, even as I want to question the, the now, we are living with a particular kind of urgency, and it may be coming to us because of algorithms, right? But it's also coming to us because of, of the governments mm -hmm. coming into power, who are completely invested in, um, you know, as Mariam Kaba says, they're el eliminationist governments. Um, so if, so then what do we do in the face of that? Um, it, it, it can't be to just proceed as if things were um, the same. I mean, the state of emergency was ongoing under Obama, et cetera, right? But it was a matter of, you know, the, the polite, uh, eloquent murderer or the um, slovenly one, <laughs> you know? I mean, so, so but, but we feel an increased sense of urgency. So what, what do we do in the face of that? Um, I'm probably just reiterating the question, but I think, you know, it is a time to, um, to work collectively, to do different kinds of political education, but we are in the face of uh, global eliminationist regimes. What do we do in the face of that? Like the, the work that we do has to try to make something visible and possible. And I don't think that that's the kind of deferral. I mean, that is about speaking into the present. Um. Uh, just very quickly, because I know there are other question. Uh, one thing I would like to say about fascism, um, there was a tendency to think about the 1930s and forgetting the colonial roots of fascism. In France, fascism arrived also during the uh, war against Algeria. It was a very moment of a great moment, fascism, and incredible. And we know Germany also, the colonial roots of fascism. I mean, we could go, over, of course, Mrs. arrogant discourse on colonialism. So this, I think, is relevant for us also. Not to fall into the narrative of fascism born in Europe and just for Europe and all the story that goes with that, but showing the colonial root of, race, of fascism, and already that kind of free us from you know this being absorbed in that narrative uh, that that then therefore mask 
the colonial roots of fascism. That will be just my first remark. The second thing I was thinking, what kind of rights uh, black feminism, you know, will elaborate that are not the Bill of Rights. So what will be the right that we fight for so we don't fall into the liberal rights versus uh, fascist attack on these rights? And so we end up defending this right that in fact have been, you know, elaborated to oppress. It. So what will be effectively, so the this is a right to existence, what will be effectively to, to elaborate this right and to fight for this right? and to give back, you know, to write their content, uh, the content again, you know, about the radical promise of, of living here and now in the world. And I'm thinking, of course, the right to existence, but because of my work also, I'm thinking about the right to reproduction, you know, because in the world you have women who have the right to give birth, and so many women who do not have the right to give birth. I mean, they, have, they can give birth, but their, their baby can die, and they can die, I mean, it does not matter. They don't have the right to become mother, you know. To, so that could be, you know, like thinking, so that could be also a work to do, and to bring them together the, the, uh, with everything that's going on also, environmental destruction. How do we elaborate rights that will be grounded in that history of, uh, and that will effectively show something that this is worth fighting for and not for your liberal rights that have been in fact being used to oppress us. Just to, to come back to the issue of the translation because I think there is something there that we have been a bit too quick and perhaps it can be a connection with the other part of the conversation. Uh, as you know that the Martinican uh, poet Edouard Glissant talk about the translation as a poetical art. He says it's something super central, have to be considered with a real poetic. That's mean for him something politic. Why? Because I think there, there is a kind of, let's say, techno translation that would be made by machine and people there that are working super well. And I think that they are doing an incredible job, I have to say. But if you Consider that question, yeah, we can clap them, because I think they are doing something incredible. But I think if we take time and stay with the translation, there's something happen, something more. And that thing is that first thing that the translation is not, uh, is a kind of transportation. I, I prefer use the term of transduction. That means that a part of the speaker is coming with the words. So it's not only a machine that making the job, is a person. And with, with the translation, we can reflect about the question of positionality, different geography, different context, different gender, different time. And so that reason why it's a super interesting uh, matter. I personally don't care how to translate blackness, which have been produced in super specific black American context. And so it's not the matter of something like me coming from the banlieue in France. We need all the terms, all the kind of contradictions that are located in our own stories. And if it doesn't fit, it's meaningful. If it, it means something, that there is an effort that have been done in an American context, an Anglo-American context, which we won't do the same kind of effort. We won't do it in the same way. We need to, to make our own cooking with the languages. So if that thing is doesn't fit to make, my, to make the meal I want to make for my friends, I don't use that. I will use something else. So I'm sorry. It's as, like spices. This is, I don't need that word. It doesn't work with my life. Because I think it's really powerful in a certain context. It's a construction. It's a context coming within the world. So I think the issue of translation is also a way to talk about a, a second notion I think is super central for us. This is the witness. Because finally the translator is, a, the, the gesture of translation is a gesture of testimony of something. It's not only, so we don't need machine to make that, even if I'm sometimes used up. And the algorithm says things, sometimes funny. But we need also all the kind of production of translation is possible within people coming from different contexts and the way they transform languages to make it more comfortable for them. That's the reason why some terms, specifically in the context of academics, are something not super easy or interesting to use because they are so built as solid concepts that have been used worldwide that we better create other fucking words more playful, more active, more vivid, and not stay with a language that is not ours. I'm sorry, just to say that. Thank you. Uh, my name's Angelica. I work with Kojo Eshen. He's um, not here, and he sends his apologies. Um, 
Actually, I just wanted to think about what uh, Sadia was saying and um, also Olivier um, just now. Uh, we were with Denise in Berlin, Olivier, myself, and Jota's here, um, actually considering this question of what to do. Um, I think the last three weeks have given me this sense of um, absolute, not only urgency, but terror of, of fear, of uh, a sense of absolute paralyzing fear. Um, and uh, this sense that there is an in, a new enclosure act going on that is being manufactured and organized by the neo-fascists who are all being funded by the same people, more or less, it seems. Um, and, you know, there is a sense of hopelessness and, you know, I think, who is it, Nietzsche says that su thoughts of suicide help us get us through the night so we wake up another day. Um, and then, you know, but on the positive side, I want to think about radical love um, and the gestures of radical love, which I think need to mean now, um, or could mean now, maybe thinking along the lines of uh, how to um, work. I think the problem is that we've all just been, in a way, we are enclosed in our own world. There is an increasing sense of talking to ourselves. Um, and certainly, uh, I work as a black collective in London for 20 years, me and Kojo, it's a precarious platform. Um, you know, we have constantly tried to be much more generous than just think about ourselves and our practice and making art for an increasingly toxic art world. Um, one, I think, needs to think about reinvent, rethinking about what art making is about at all. And, you know, I was thinking post the Berlin experience how important it is to bring people together from many other fields, um, many other communities um, in a place like London, for instance, where we work. So instead of just talking to people in the art world or students or whatever, to actually start talking to all these different other collectives um, of, say, teachers' movements, also scientists, also um, many different people who I think when uh, Spivak says, I want to cry the jubilant call of the World Social Forum, I think we have to think like that within the urban environments now. We have to think like that because otherwise we've got a situation of absolute social death, as Mbembe kind of talks about in that essay of his or the end of calls the end of humanity. Um, so I don't know if that's clear, but I've just been thinking a lot about how to re re restructure um, a relationship to to who we talk to um, in relation to how to how to basically storm the institutions because all the institutions are full of neo fascists. You know, every institution has neo-fascists in them. The, you know, one has to, um, uh, in a way, st um, storm the institution <laughs> with our friends and with people that we're not used to talking to, because otherwise we're going to... Pe I mean, I've just come back from the States. I was in Pittsburgh and I spoke to all kinds of people. I was like, do you know what fascism is? They're like, no, what's fascism? So we are, I think there is an absolute urgency to talk to people and to find a language of talking to people uh, or to bring to people together from many different groups and many different movements and just and many different forms of expertise specifically in relation to the juridical um, in terms of rethinking um, how to speak to a greater to how to speak to others basically I wanted to go back to um, the uh, question that Sayadi raised also um, in relation to some of the things that you all were saying, which is, uh, you know, which have to do with temporality. So to remind again that, um, you know, this is not the first time we're seeing this, and uh, that, you know, the, as we all know, the liberal project is based on a set of property relations and processes of racialization that have always worked toward undermining black humanity. So. Um, what I wanted to say, I guess, was that, you know, at every moment where we've seen this kind of configuration consolidating, people respond. And since you raised um, the issue of Rastafari, I'll use that as an example, too. People respond in ways that don't typically confine themselves to states 
right, and that normally exceed the boundaries, certainly of liberal projects, but of the territorial dimensions of that global liberal project of, you know, 1492. So I think, you know, what happens is that often those people are called crazy because they have a vision that does not conform to normative political action. So I think one of the things that we can do is not call them crazy when the vision is being um, put forward and to, to think anew alongside in ways that doesn't marginalize an alternative view of social and political organization. I'll keep it to one question for one person, Jean Francois. Uh, although everything is so great. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, uh, and maybe repeat a, a, um, something I wrote down that the past of genocide and slavery is our future. Um, which I think kind of is a formulation that for me explains why I, I, I'm, I'm sort of really not and never have been an Afrofuturist. If an Afrofuturist means we're looking at a future in which there's no slavery and slavery is in the past. I feel like the fight against abolitionism is a constant struggle, right? And I think this is the basis of what you and so many people in the room have been saying today. So that's just like, um, I wanted to check and say that I got that right. But then I also wanted to ask about um, material and immaterial labor. Uh, you gave us the image that landed for me of the woman who cleans the hotel room, you know, the hotel room that I got out of this morning and will return to tonight, you know. And so I'm thinking about that labor which you are describing as slavery. And I'm thinking about, I guess I'll own it, my, my own labor of immaterial labor, which feels like slavery. So where do we go from there? Do we have to answer? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I could start to say, but we all do labor, right? I mean, there is always labor. What I wanted to say about this woman, it was that um, for me, it's a central question of the struggle against racial capitalism this woman who clean and care, because cleaning and caring is for me, in fact, they're caring about the world by cleaning it. And it's always seen as um, um, it's domestic work. I mean, all this world that mask uh, the centrality of what they do. Um, um, and we started with slavery, you know, a woman working to, to clean, I mean, to make the plantation, I mean, the, the, the the slave owner's world, you know, uh, alive. And it, se it seems to me that this centrality is not yet at, at really the art of the analysis. It's always considered because it's women's work, domestic work, so of course we will fight against it and we will ask for rights, you know, that they, they have to be recognized as workers. But then in the meantime, it will not be recognized that the racialization, the feminization, the underpaid, underqualified work is absolutely at the art of the construction of racial capital and that they will never have the full rights because then if they have the full right, there is no more capital. <laughs> the racial capitalism fall. So it was to go again, you know, to um, that, that the the black woman's work, you know, and the black woman's womb who have been, you know, uh, constant, I mean, the black woman rape to produce again, you know, the, the, the future slave. I mean, to me, it's like how do, to bring back again in a, at the center of the analysis of racial capitalism today, as effectively it's, it's still going on, you know, so the past is with us, is not, is not in the back, the past is with us. And I wanted to, to ask Denise something if, I mean, I'm sorry, that's an aside, but it's a conversation. If you do think that the conce another conception of time you think will be useful, the Malaga for the Malagashi, the past is before you, because you know it, you know, so it's, it, it's before you. And the future is behind you because you, you don't know it, you never see it, you know. And so at New Year, when the New Year arrives, so it's as if it arrives on your shoulder, so there is an expression that it has arrived on your shoulder. So, and so, soon it's going to become in Alpha. Uh, and for me, it was very, uh, because, you know, uh, it was part of my education, 
to go to grow up with this idea of time and not at all with effectively uh, but so uh, here I'm boop, taking a detour sorry back to back to work uh, <laughs> and um, so where do we go for, from there I mean the, I, of course the material work but again I, what I say about the, this question of the the woman work this uh, the black woman work is to I don't see um, a feminism that, that is, of course, anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and anti biased but not taking that question of the cleaning, caring, as the most important terrain of struggle today, because it brings together health, chemical industry, organization, uh, the fact that white women can ask for equality and better pay and, and uh, becoming also, you know, why they don't have the 50-50 question, you know, that's possible. Uh, the way they translated the Me Too, which of course was started by a black woman, but the way they started, look, one man at a time, you know, we will, we will defeat patriarchy by taking one man at a time. Oh my God, we will never have defeated, right? It's like, it's like, yeah, yeah. So I mean, all, 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 uh, so for me, it's, it's we, it's it's go to say the yeah uh, question. What do we do today? I think, um, and to uh, I cannot remember who said that. I think, in fact, because it's a very difficult time, and I know it has happened before, but it's happening to us. So it's it's happening to me. It's not. It's certainly happened to my grand grandmother, but it's happening to me, so I have to think. I think it's very interesting because it makes us think. We have to think very hard, very, very, very hard. And um, even though we had the critic of liberalism, we were living with it. And now we know we cannot live, you know, that that has reached a moment, I think, of, of breaking really, really with that, like as other moment, in fact. People have done it before, but there is a new content to give to that, it seems to me, today, because uh, the, there is also a new configuration, as you were saying. It's the same, but not quite the same. How much time do we have? Like, two, one minute? We have about 10 minutes. Okay, I'll try to be quick, like two minutes, because, um, and I think, I um, will comment on all the comments on uh, Olivier comment on translation and Angelique comment on radical love and the question of the question of time. Um, so the Malgash, somebody had told me, uh, mentioned it um, not long ago actually, about three months ago, and I was like, oh wow, because I have been trying to think um, and also thinking about how we have to think radically including in how we think about translation and love, radical love um, and everything else. So going back to the women who do the cleaning and the, the, and the reproductive labor, the, the caring labor, one of the, the things that I've been attend, trying to attend to with the infrared radiation is precisely the, how the past is my image, the image for me is not so much, it's not in front of us uh, physically, but it is something that we attend to, right? It's the attending to that I got as, as the meanings. So if we think in terms of infrared, with infrared radiation and, um, and kinetic motion, we can, or oh, kinetic energy, sorry, motion of bodies, we can think, we can also think that when somebody does work, right, they're spending energy and that energy is being transferred to that on which they are working. And so we have the accumulation of the work done in the past, which is here, and we have the continued uh, release of energy of the work that's done by the women who are cleaning our rooms in the hotel. Right? And that will be the past that we would attend to um, all the time. Uh, so just a kind of an ontological, an ontological shift that then we make uh, all the other claims to even having that which is actually the embodiment of the, this worker's energy as something that it's mine or something to which I would have um, 
All right. I don't know if that made sense. I was trying to be quick uh, in that one. Um, so if I have a model of a material, actual really material embodied in that, at that level, conception of everything, then, then our, I think our priorities will shift radically. Any other responses? Or have we exhausted our capacity? Um, <laughs> because it's been a very long night. I just want to thank all of our panelists, but also this wonderful audience for your attention, for your engagement. Um, and before we close, I also want to say, we're not closing. <laughs> we have another evening tomorrow that I would like to invite you back to, um, featuring a reading by Dion Brand and a conversation between Dion Brand and Saidia Hartman. That starts tomorrow at 5.30 in the uh, um, Salle de Conference, which is directly adjacent. It's the other door. But please, thank you all for your powerful comments.